Welcome, 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 one and all. Glad to be back again with you with my favorite fellow basement dweller, Mr. Mo Money. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, everyone out there. We are here. I'm JD. As always, this is the Basement Brothers podcast. This is episode number four. We are moving and grooving, and we are uh, we're, we're, we're snapping necks and uh, cashing checks, as they say. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> First topic today is is the wonderment and the, I guess, incredible growth of a little no unknown cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. Absolutely crazy. I never thought in my life that I would see a, basically a, what you could call a, a phony currency, something that doesn't even exist, an intangible, not phony, I shouldn't say phony, an intangible, untangible currency. Uh, basically go from a, a point where it was absolutely worthless, where, where you, you'd have to trade 10,000 of these things basically symbolically to get a, a small pizza yeah. to the point where these hit over $50,000 a coin. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really don't know how, to, how to say anything more than incredible and not something I ever thought I would see. I wish I was a lot smarter when these things came out. And I, I know there was opportunities back when I first seen them to, I could have stockpiled a few thousand of these coins myself and I didn't pay any attention to it. So it, it shows me I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be dumb when technology comes out, right? Like pay attention. <laughs> well, you know what? Bitcoin is, is interesting to me. And, and, and much like you, I did not join the craze at all. Like, at no point like of course when it started to you know gain a lot of value i was kicking myself like maybe i should have put a couple of bucks in but like um for me it was just hard to to see value in something that to me didn't represent a, a true currency you know i know that it was always talk about uh going to uh a current like a, a non-physical currency sort of way of, of transacting business like getting rid of of actual money and you know we have debit cards and credit cards and things of that such and i'm like this just seems like a crock and it looks like a way that people are going to really lose a lot of money um yeah. and that's why i didn't yeah. jump on board i i agree i i think everybody thought it was a it was a flash in the pan it was a scam um the concept of crypto was relatively new where you used a blockchain that validates all of the transaction histories, which there's a lot of bizarre uses for this that in a real world that are probably going to become more prevalent as even the years flash on. But yeah, in the beginnings, I really didn't pay attention to it and I really wish I would have. Um, and there's been other coins that have come around in, in there in its stead, like, like Solana. Uh, there's been coins like Ethereum. That was probably the next biggest Bitcoin type coin that, you know, has, has really gained value, but to your point as well about the, the, the volatility, I got into crypto a couple of years ago, not really knowing anything about it. And I thought, you know what, now's the time to dive in, to get going. And, and things were looking really good in the very beginning. I got into these NFT programs, these projects, uh, there was, there was money being made everywhere. I was sitting in a uh, program where I could have made anywhere between Eight thousand to even fourteen thousand dollars a month in wow. in the coin I was earning, and I'm not I'm not shitting you. Within two months of me kind of getting in and, and really investing, and and I put a good amount of cash into the game right away, which wasn't a smart idea. Yeah. I was riding this wave of wow, everything looks unbelievable. Of course, due to my you know fantastic luck, about two and a half three months into this whole thing was the biggest crypto winter we've ever seen where the markets basically tanked there were people in the discords that were there were kids that were talking in some discords that i that i was in that were had lost six hundred thousand dollars in in like a two or three days in some cases Goodness. there were suicides you know there were there it was the craziest it was like black friday 1929 it was people jumping from the buildings so uh, insane it sounds like a real life roller coaster, you know, starting very low, getting very, very high, and then going very, very low again yeah. at some point, you know? 
it's just so volatile when you have a currency that doesn't really ha- doesn't really exist except for these blockchain entries. There, there's also a lot of people, and I found this out when I was in in the market for a while, that are doing these what what's are, what are to be called pump and dump schemes, yeah. right? So they'll use influencers, they use these people to really pump up the value of a coin, and cause people to obviously to hold and cause sales to happen and all these different things to happen. And when these influencers that have these millions of dollars worth of these coins pump the price artificially up, they're the first ones dumping them in the market. Now in the stock market, this is heavily regulated by all kinds of trade organizations. And of course the uh, FTC and different government regulators watch these things. But in the crypto market, there was nobody watching any of this stuff. Now, I think there is more regulation coming. There's more people kind of keeping. The FTX scandal was another big one about a year. Kind of read up on that. Yeah, that's uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, I think is his name. Sam Bankman-Fried. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, no, um, you hit the nail on the head when you were you were speaking about regulations and, you know, it not being regulated. And um, that was one of my biggest fears. You know, if you have a bank account, uh you know, you're you're insured for like what hundred what two hundred and fifty thousand dollars if there's some sort of fraud or something that occurs in your account and you have a sense of security. When it came to crypto, there was no regulation. Like like you said, you have the pump and dump schemes that were going on. Um the the other thing that really alarmed me was the fact that like if you lost like your your password or your code word or whatever it was, um literally you could not access that 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 coin. You couldn't access your money, and basically yeah. you're locked out. And then you also had like a piracy that was going on, where people were literally uh, stealing people's coins. So, um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and of course nobody knew about it, right? Until these things happened, you know, by the time you'd lost all your money, it's like, oh, now we know that you know there's these types of piracy games and scams that can occur. And, and of course, as you learn more, and unfortunately, if you're the person that had to learn it the hard way, you, you kind of got, you know, stuck on the, uh, the, the old head on the spit. Yeah. What do you see has been the future of crypto? Do you think it would ever be something that's no longer like this taboo sort of uh, thing that people kind of, you know, dabble in? Will it be something that's considered like really, truly legitimate and, and something that can be trusted? Yeah, I think I think we've kind of gotten there. It's it's just I think where the I think in terms of the the the, the back end, in terms of the the structure of how the coins work, and in terms of the ecosystem, I think the technology is already there, and I think everything's set up. I think I think where we're headed is we need some sort of official regulation on some of these things just to avoid um, the scams, right? We just to avoid people getting ripped off, or like you said, there there may be a different way to handle the security of the coin because you could lose all your money in w- just by having one bad key, you know, on, on a USB drive or something. So, I mean, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of things that have to come down the pipe to make it as robust as let's say paper currency would be. Uh, but yeah, I think the tech is there. I think it's just kind of creatively figuring out a way to make it safer for people to actually use. There are companies using it as, you know, transactional now. I mean, there, you can buy Bitcoin and, and different, uh, cryptocurrencies in like ATMs now too. They they got them all over. So it's it's definitely changing rapidly. I guess what confuses me, like you know, you have Bitcoin, right? Um, one Bitcoin is like what fifteen k or something. I don't know what the value is now. What, what's the value? Right of- around thirty seven thousand again. Thirty six, thirty seven thousand. They were over fifty when I was getting into crypto. They were over fifty thousand dollars a coin. And I'm not kidding you. There were guys that I knew of back in the day, and I don't even know if they had any of their coins anymore, but there was people I knew of that had 10,000, 15,000 of these coins, you know, 18 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's like, whenever it formed, I don't even remember exactly, it's somewhere around that time time frame. But to think about having 10, 15,000 of these on, on, a, on a USB drive that's worth 50,000 a coin, you know, basically a multimillionaire. Yeah. yeah. Insane. You know, and it happened. It, there was a lot of people that were able to get in and get out and make millions of dollars. And now it's back going back up that way again. I mean, it's it's you know nearing forty thousand dollar mark again. How do you subdivide a, a a Bitcoin? Like if I have a pocket full of change, I know if I've got say four quarters and I go to a vending machine and the snack that I want to buy is fifty cents, which we know there's no such snack in this day that's only fifty cents. But let's say yeah. if it's fifty cents, I know I pop 
two quarters into the machine, press the button, bam, I got the candy or whatever it is that I want. I've got two quarters left over. How do you subdivide a Bitcoin? So it seems it, so it, singular. You yeah, know? It, well, and, and the concept of it is if you have 1.0 coin, it's worth $50,000 or whatever the current value is. But you everything's transactional. So when you send a Bitcoin payment towards something, you, it, let's say they've agreed on the, on the cost of the item is going to be 0. 0.0004 of a Bitcoin. Okay. That's what you're actually sending. So it's transactional based upon the value at the time of the Bitcoin. So you're never sending like a whole coin and it's being subdivided. You're just, you're just sending a percentage of a coin. Gotcha. If that makes sense. No, it makes sense. I'm just trying to figure out how do they subdivide that coin? Yeah, how do you yeah. keep up with something like that when it, like you're saying, with things being kind of volatile and the value fluctuating, like what a coin is worth today may not be what it's worth, say, next week or next month. And like, how is, how is that, how does that even manage? How do you keep up with that within the transaction? You know? Well, it's and that's the problem. It's so volatile that it could be worth fifty thousand dollars today. Tomorrow, it can be worth zero or negative zero. I mean, if there's some sort of you know, like with FTX, where the where the market their market crashed there, which was kind of a scam. It sounded like the way it kind of all was put together. Um, there was coins in there that caused the prices to drop down to nothing, and they had their own coin as well that went down to zero. So I mean, you could have a coin worth ten thousand dollars, and tomorrow it's worth negative. So in some cases, it's, it's crazy. Wow. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what the future has in store for cryptocurrency. Um, I'm still a little gun shy, but uh, I'm curious to see. And I'll, I will watch uh, and see if and when I will jump into the market. But speaking of volatility, moving into uh, our next portion of this segment, um, have you seen the weather this season? I mean... You've got places that are in, you know, you know, historically colder temperatures um, around this time of year that are seeing like warm May, June like temperatures. And then you have some places um, in the south that have experienced uh, colder weather. These weather patterns are becoming uh, more and more unpredictable. And it's just it's really wild to me. I was wondering you know, what was your take on it? I, same thing. This winter has been so bizarre in terms of, of the overall temperature. Like it's, it's, it's the warmest that I've ever recalled it to be, especially through February where normally, uh, you know, where we would see temperatures, you know, in anywhere from the twenties to the well below zero, uh, we, literally the temperatures were more like this. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's like, this is the new winter we have to look forward to. And for me, that's, I'm perfectly happy with that. Like I, I enjoy a moderate winter, um, but yeah, unseasonable to say the least. Uh, it, it does seem to be affecting some businesses that, you know, like snow removal businesses that rely on the snow to fall, but and that's another gamble, you know? Yeah, definitely. Think about it. If, if your entire, uh, you know, your entire year, your income for the year is based on uh, the winter and then you have a winter like what we've, just experience, I got to imagine you're out of some money because you've got uh, maybe a fleet of trucks, you've got staff that's dependent on you, you have all of all of these apparatus that are set up based on colder weather and ice and snow removal, and it just doesn't happen. What do you do? You know? Yeah, I don't know if there's insurances kind of like the farmers have where they have a bad crop year, if there's a way that they can kind of dip into some insurance payments. Or I, I'm not sure exactly what they do. I don't know if it's just so volatile that they that they basically, you know, kind of come in and out of business, you know, based upon the trend because it's like they can't guarantee the weather year to year. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I know it's a business I don't think I'd like to be in just because it's so you're just unknown what you're going to run into. Yeah. Well, I can appreciate the warmer weather, but I, you know, honestly, I love the, the change of seasons. I love to see areas that you can go to and see the leaves change color and, and fall and, you know, maybe get some snow around the holidays. It seems to make uh, people more festive and more friendly and kind of suits the season. And um, I don't know if I'm ready to see a winter where it's like a tropical paradise everywhere. Um, I, I do think we need these areas 
um, in the country where you can go to and enjoy the slopes and enjoy a little powder, not the kind that goes in your nose, but the kind that you <laughs> step in, you know, and, and really enjoy the season, you know? Remember, if you live in an area that enjoys heavy winters, you, you may have to powder your nose. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do they call that? Uh, seasonal depression or something? Yeah, I'll just start walking around town like, hey, man, let me tell you one time, man. You got you to gotta use a powder, man. You know, let's go for you, man. It's going to make you healthy. Yeah. Okay. Well, moving right along, uh, we're moving to our next section that we love to call Knee Jerks. Yes, indeed. What you got for us, JD? Well, you know, there's the world is filled with all kinds of, uh, well, I guess people. Uh, you know, people are are very adverse. You know, they have all kinds of uh, uh, different issues they deal with. This person, well, you'll see the kind of issues he's dealing with here. Okay. She would love to spend the night with me in my room. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh my God. There's things flying. There's... <laughs> oh, my God. Is this like a joke? <laughs> I thought it was, but I don't... And the more I've watched this, I don't think it is. This person, I think, is just. Well, it looks so cozy, doesn't it? I can imagine us cuddling. Then you... I heard you would love to spend the night. Oh, my <laughs> God. I could, I could imagine what that room smells like. I can almost smell that room through this let's, video. Let's just take a look at a few of the things. Like it, th there's nowhere to stand inside of this room. It's completely covered with, and we're not talking about yesterday's garbage. We're talking about months to years of old, decrepit, decaying food. Look at this mattress. Look at the mattress. It's, oh my God! It's 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 worn through in the center to the springs. It's so dirty and decrepit, the and that's mildew. What oh my God! Molds. Every corner of this place is. You have to step on garbage. Look and look at the bugs. There's bugs flying. There's an old treadmill that got thrown in here. <laughs> And then there's like an old, there's full of bugs eating some, like an old ice cream pail or something. Oh my God. I'm, I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt and say, maybe he works for a company that cleans up like abandoned apartments or something. I can't imagine a person really living in this. Cause I've, I'm familiar with hoarders. I've watched those hoarder shows like most people and they've got a lot of stuff, but it's usually something they could actually sell as, you know, some trinkets, some family uh, memorabilia, whatever. This is just trash. I can't imagine a person living in this. Mo Money, this is the face of America right here. Good this is God. the face of America. <laughs> you want to come snuggle with me in my broken box brings bed with the uh, mold and the dirt and bugs? Oh my God. Just well, unbelievable. Like it, it it's yeah. I don't know if I don't know if it's heartbreaking or hilarious. It's one of the two. Maybe on a uh, on a broadcast when we have a little bit more time, we can kind of dig into the comments and, and maybe get a follow-up. Like I'm really curious now as to whether this guy is really serious. And like I guess what would be scare what what would be scarier than the condition of that room and the fact that he's in it is if he actually had any takers. Like if somebody's like, Yeah, I'll I'll take you up on that. I'll come and you know, snuggle with you. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to say. It's, it's bizarre. I, as, as weird as society's become and culture has kind of moved into, it's like, I don't really have any problem believing that that's possibly a true video with a true person. It's gotten like, I watch hoarders a lot. I watch that show. And I, the other day I watched, I watched one where a lady had literally been taking a dump in her kitchen for like seven years. It was filled to the ceiling with toilet paper and literally poop. And she'd been living within that for upwards a decade. Why? What was her, her bathroom not functioning? Well, well her bathroom, her, her bathroom was fine until she eventually filled it with feces and then couldn't use it anymore. And then, 
And then basically she decided to start taking a dump in her kitchen because oh, that was a better place to conserve. I mean, it, 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 when you watch this stuff, it, it just boggles the mind. It really does. You know, we, we did a show a little a little while back, and we were talking about mental illness. I gotta imagine that this would be in the category of mental illness to to subject yourself to this sort of lifestyle. I agree, and I and from what this video looks like, this guy's either completely mentally ill, or or I agree with you. It could be a stunt. It could be just him going to some literally dump ground of an abandoned shack. Because we're we're talking about a place that's uninhabitable. Yeah, it's by humans. Like I mean, animals wouldn't live in there. A dog wouldn't live on that mattress. <laughs> <laughs> and and my, I've seen my dog lick his own asshole. That's a great segue. Speaking of dogs, uh, the next uh, portion of this segment uh, is related to just that man's best friend, and in particular, we have a border collie by the name of Pink. This video is couple of years old. I want to say it was 2019, but when I saw this, it just really resonated to me. One, because I'm physically out of shape and this dog is clearly an athlete, um, but two, just the proficiency and how he ran this course. Take a look at it and let me know what you think. Yeah, look at him. Full energy. Yeah, he's ready to go. That is it. <laughs> my dog does not listen that well. Not my, mine either. <laughs> Jennifer, okay. sure Look at the speed, man. Yeah, you're right. That dog is fast. Oh, like the wow. camera could barely keep up with them. That's crazy. Stay, stay. Good job. Look at the extension. Is doing on his jump. Just wow. It's just no ahead. effort either. The dog's not even, it's like nothing to him. Oh, that's crazy. Look at that. Look at that. Keeping the feet footing to it. <laughs> wow. And, and he did all of that. And I think literally he just wants a treat and a hug, you know? <laughs> wow. If I did that, I'd want like a bag of money. Like if I survived, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible, dude. Yeah, uh, pink is fast as shit. Like pink wow. is really fast. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, to to be able to train a dog to that ability is really. I mean, it goes to show you not only the the amount of time that these people spend, but just the intelligence of the intelligence of the animal. Yeah. Right. To be able to understand to do those things on command, it's like clearly the the dog knows much more of of the human world than what we give them credit for a lot of the times. Yeah. And and you wonder like how much of it is the training and how much of it is just natural ability. Cause like in sports, you know, you have a lot of basketball players, but you only had like one Michael Jordan, you know, you yeah. have one Tom Brady. Like, is he like this once in a, in a lifetime or once in a generation sort of dog athlete, like what makes him so much better than most dogs that I've ever seen run any sort of course, you know? I, you know, it's got to be excellence in within the breeding. It's got to be just excellence within the training and the handling and just the, the what, probably one of those perfect storm situations where everything came together for that animal. You know, the trainer was just so in tune with it that they're able to make those adjustments and make things happen to that, that uh, speed, which is just incredible. Well, way to go pink. Um, I am now officially a fan of pink. So <laughs> long live pink. There we go. We're going to move into our next segment. So the next segment we have is basically the concept that yuppie culture has kind of basically taken over again. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of people that are generating a lot of wealth at a young age. You know, there's ki kids out there today that are anywhere between 18 and 25 years old, and they're multimillionaires, many times over in some cases. Uh, it's it's really bizarre because there's so many kids that look up to these people. You know, a lot of them are online influencers, social media stars, celebrities, people like, let's take somebody like Mr. Beast, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, these guys are worth, you know, if not millions, a billion dollars, pretty close. I, I can't remember what Mr. Beast company was valued at, at, at one point, but I think it was even close to a billion dollars. And the issue with it is kids now have to live up to this like Mount Olympus 
size, uh, you know, person they have to stand next to. Like this 22 year old kid is worth $600 million. This other 22 year old kid hasn't even worked a job yet. Yeah, probably living I don't in know. his parents' basement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. I don't know about you, but I, I don't see anything good from that. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think about the, the natural cycle of life, right? Typically for, you know, let's say for a man, right? Typically for a man, he hits his economic stride probably around middle age, you know, mid, late 30s, or early to mid 40s. He's really... He's cooking with gas, right? Um, now, if you're telling me that the expectation is that, like, at 22 or 24, you're a multimillionaire, you know, probably a bunch of crypto, uh, really, really influential. And, like, if you're 28 years old, you're, like, probably washed up and, you know, over the hill. That sets a whole new level of, of pressure that I don't think is going to be good for, for society. I couldn't agree more. I think as, as frail as society's become with, with kids being more and more pushed into their mid teens, late teens, mid twenties to early thirties before they're even really expected to become an adult. Now, uh, I don't see getting a kid who was kind of a late bloomer. When, when I say late bloomer, like 35 is now like the age where they expect these kids to kind of start becoming adults that kid's already lo like an old over the hill old man by now, by today's standards. I just don't see it feasible for people to be able to believe that they're going to all be able to achieve this level of wealth. And when they don't, the depression and the amount of psychological effects that set in on them has got to be devastating. Yeah. I got to imagine you're going to have probably people, you know, unfortunately checking out because they can't, live up to that pressure and that standard, you know, and it's unfortunate. Completely unfortunate. I would agree. And I would say, you know, good segue in terms of checking out is, is in people at a young age or even an old age, this, this last year, uh, into, into 2024, we've had a lot of, of wrestlers passing away. Some old, some not so old. Yeah. You yeah. know, here's a perfect example. Shiki baby, shiki baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> I break your back, I make you humble. Listen, the camel, the, uh, I said camel, the camel clutch was the move back in the day. Like, that was the move. You know, I could call putting my little cousins in the camel clutch. So. <laughs> <laughs> Completely bad. And the thing about the Iron Sheik, and people don't really think about this, is this guy was one of the first original, legitimate, like, wrestling champions, like amateur wrestling yeah. champions who came over into the pro wrestling business. Prior to his entry to the business, most of the people were, you know, there were some strong men types, and there were some people that came from, it was more of a carnival background. That's where the wrestling business really came from. And this guy was a legitimate, like, bodyguard you know, amateur wrestler. Like, I mean, he was, he was the real deal. Yeah. Not to mention his work as a heel. Like he was literally like the heel of all heels, particularly in that, that era, like his heel work, uh, crossed, you know, the globe, like the, like countries, like you literally, it pitted, uh, country versus country. Whenever the Sheik was on the scene, he's waving his, his flag and, you know, he's, you know, you know, getting the crowd into it. And like, yeah, you know, he man. was a perfect uh, antagonist to a character, like say Hulk Hogan, you know, and especially, yeah. Country inter-country sentiment, right? Like, like, I mean, he, he took that middle Eastern thing and he ran with it and people hated him. It wasn't, it wasn't your traditional heel of like, we just don't like this guy because he's a bad guy. They hated his ethnicity. Yes. Yes, yes. And then, you know, you're mentioning Hulk Hogan is perfect because without Hulk Hogan, I believe there wouldn't be really a wrestling business as we know it today. And this guy literally was the first guy that handed over Hulk Hogan. He, he was the guy that put him over, made him the first champion. He sure did. He went on to call him a jabroni after the fact, but, you know, he did. <laughs> he did put him over. <laughs> then again, he called quite a few people a jabroni towards his later years. Hogan, you jabroni. <laughs> <laughs> you you shut your mouth, Hogan. I make, I break your back. I make you humble. Oh, I love you, Hulk Hogan. Come on, man. God, God rest and God bless the Iron Sheik. Speaking of another classic. There it is. Our uh, friend, Ole Anderson. I, I want to call him Iron because uh, 
Of course, they look so similar, brother, but they do look similar. You know, you got no. the the grizzled beard, but like Ole Anderson was one of those old school wrestlers that I hated him. Like I, I, I liked the Horseman. It was the first time that, like, for me, uh, a heel. A heel group is something that I, I aspired to be, and I, I enjoyed their work. I enjoyed the Four Horsemen, but I was never fond of Oli. Oli's always seemed like that that one miserable, grumpy old guy uh, that you'd run into in the street, and like he'd, you know, he'd fight you tooth and nail for like a parking <laughs> spot or something. And I don't know how much of that was like the persona in, in, in the ring, and how much of it is who he truly was, but if he was playing a character, and that's not who he really was, he played it to the T because I really believed it. Oli loved using such phrases as the drizzling shits to explain <laughs> other wrestlers. He was a guy that was not only a curmudgeon in his in his young age, but he grew into it as he got older. Yeah. He had an incredible hatred for people like Ric Flair. It was unbelievable. I watched a lot of shoot interviews with Oli, and he pulls no punches on anybody, and he literally was not a mark for any of these guys. You know, he basically looked at his fellow wrestlers as ba basically all phonies and jobbers to an ex extent. And and he, obviously he was a guy that had some pull in the business. He was a booker and he had some ownership of some territory sites down in the old days. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this guy was mean as a rattlesnake. And I can't imagine that his attitude and the things that he kind of did, although great for the old wrestling business, didn't transcend over to the new wrestling entertainment business. And so I think that's why Ole was kind of put on the back shelf. Yeah, he never seemed to get the kind of shine, obviously not the shine that Ric Flair got because Flair was the man, but even his brother Arn and uh, Tully Blanchard and even J.J. Dillon, old James J. Yeah, Dillon. Manager um, of the century. Yeah, he seemed to get more play than Ole. Ole was kind of like there, kind of in the backdrop, and he was going to kick ass, uh, but he never really seemed to be pushed. He was never, I don't feel like he ever, ever really gave him any push. I don't think he had much of a, uh, like a, a, a solo career. Maybe he did not. I'm not aware of it. Uh, I believe most of his work was done um, as a tag team with his brother. You know, what were they, the uh, Minnesota Wrecking Crew, right? Yeah, yeah. Ole and Gene, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, and I think, I think he, you know, I think he got pushed to roles that were more managerial. I think he got pushed into the front office roles because he was tough and he could be somebody that could, you know, push people around to get what he needed out of them yeah. uh, for booking and things like that. But yeah, I think you're right. I think his wrestling career was kind of cut short just due to the fact that probably tough to work with. And I know him and Gene, from what I heard old stories, they used to break these guys in and when, when they broke them, they stretched them. I mean, they brought a guy in and beat the hell out of him, and that's how they broke him into the business. So, I'm sure they I'm sure they had a lot of people that didn't like those guys very well. Yeah. Well, I respect uh, the work that he put in. I respect the product that he helped to build, which was the Four Horsemen. God rest Ole Anderson and his family, or God rest Ole Anderson and God bless his family. Yeah, I completely agree. And and uh, you know, he 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 and the Sheik at least lived to be eighty in their eighties, right? So I mean, yeah. they they and, and and for for a wrestler, that's crazy. But for just a regular person, that's that's still a hell of a long life. So, yeah, yeah. Godspeed, Dioli. Yeah. This individual didn't get quite as lucky. He was super young. Yeah. Uh, just just you know, and a talent that you know, you and I spoke about it before. I didn't watch a lot of wrestling in the newer age, and I still don't. I catch some of it here and there. But he was one guy that I knew about and I understood in terms of when I would see him. I didn't watch a lot of the product, but I, when I saw Bray White, I knew it was him. I knew it was The Fiend. I knew it was these characters he created. Uh, they, they, they just stuck in my mind in terms of the new age of wrestling. Yeah. Bray Wyatt is someone that I literally discovered at the same time as the world was losing him. Um, I take this hiatus from wrestling from time to time when I don't, I'm not quite, you know, gelling with the storylines. They're not resonating with me. And I figure I need to take a little bit of a break. And during one of those breaks was the heyday for, for Bray Wyatt. You know, you had The Fiend and the Wyatt family, which kind of reminded yeah. me of uh, a little bit of Mankind mixed with a little bit of uh, 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 Manson, Charlie Manson. Yeah, it was yeah, just totally. like, like this weird sort of concoction that really worked. And um, he was actually staging a comeback and uh, he had caught COVID. And mm. it had done a lot of damage to uh, his heart. And uh, I believe he 
was so bad that he needed to like uh, keep a defibrillator near or connected to him. And a uh, long story short, he, you know, he had an appointment, uh, follow up doctor's appointment in the afternoon, and he laid down to take a nap. And I don't believe his uh, his device was with him. His medical device was like in the car, and uh, he passed away. You know, so yeah. it's unfortunate because everything that they say about him is that he was just a really wonderful guy, despite this uh, fiendish character that he played. Yeah, and and the interesting part about Bray Wyatt, and you mentioned the Wyatt family, I, I remember watching some of those uh, kind of clips back when those those guys were coming around. Very interesting. I liked how they took that horror film element that was kind of missing from wrestling. I mean, they needed some, like you know, like we were talking about Mankind, they needed some character that was just uh, like supernatural. And I think he portrayed that so well with those the rest of the, the, the Wyatt family. Uh, right, right, of stuff like Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of feel. It just had that weird, they had that weird hillbilly kind of uh thing to him that you believed it was true. Like, I literally didn't see Bray Wyatt as anybody else but that character for a long time because I didn't watch a lot of the product. So when I saw him, I just totally was sold into the character. So he was just reminds me of something like The Undertaker, able to take a character and just make that character reality. You yeah. know, so fortunately he's gone, you know, far too soon. And it sounds like, you know, obviously his health got in the way, like all these these wrestling guys. Um, good transition to the last one on the table. Our good old buddy Virgil. Virgil, Virgil. I, you know, and I don't want to sound disrespectful when I say this, but really this is like how I remember Virgil. Um, he yeah. was like, like the top stooge, like, you know, like he yeah. was the guy that was always there with the million dollar man. And I think even for a brief stint, uh, he had a brief stint, maybe even with Hogan, but Virgil was like that stooge. And like, he looked the part too. He was a guy that was just as big as everyone else. Um, I don't know how skilled he was as a wrestler. Cause I didn't get to see him do much in ring work, but he looked like the kind of dude that, you know, wouldn't put up with any crap and he'd, he'd put you down. So, you know, those are my memories of Virgil. How about you? Dude, the way they portrayed him when he came out with Ted DiBiase and he had like the, 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 the tuxedo shirt, the diamond looking white tuxedo shirt with the red yeah. trim. I think it was and the huge mass of hulking arms coming out of that thing. Yep. The guy was just looking like a, like a, like a superhero of some kind, right? Just a perfect character to portray this bodyguard guy for, for Ted DiBiase, because let's, let's be honest at that point of Ted DiBiase's career, he was already pretty old. Yep. You know, Ted DiBiase was really coming out in the late seventies in the old Ric Flair days. Uh, and, and when he got in million dollar man, he was more of a figurehead character than he ever really was a believable wrestler, at least to me, Yeah. you know, in the early nineties, I, I always just saw Ted DiBiase as this, like, you know, you believed he was a millionaire and you believe Virgil was this ultra tough superhero bodyguard next to him with, the, as we can see him with the million, million dollar belt. Yep. Um, a great time for wrestling, a great, very comic book. And, and to me was one of my favorite times of wrestling, probably because I was around the age, you know, that, that stuff was, was like watching a cartoon and I, and I loved it. Yeah. I want to say that Virgil was the precursor to characters like Zeus. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, was it tiny Lester, you know, yep, that yep, character tiny Lester. Like, he, he died not too long ago too. He sure did. Sure. He sure did. You know? Um, so the WWE or WWF at that time realized that there was a space for a character like that. And uh, he filled that space perfectly. You know, he even went over to the WCW at one point. So um, yep. I don't think he ever made the money that those top guys drew. So um, I don't know a whole lot about his story after, you know, he left uh, professional wrestling. I don't know if you're familiar with it. If you are, yeah. you can you know, I've just read for, and heard from other people on podcasts talking about it, and 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 um, basically, they, he, you know, to your point, he didn't really make the money these guys made, and so he kind of became one of these guys that would either kind of strong arm people for money at shows. He would ask a kid if he wanted an autograph. When the kid would agree, he'd give the autograph. He would come in and say something like, "Okay, it's twenty bucks," oh. you know, like kind of kind of really strong arm some of these people for, not in a not in a mean way but i mean and people understood that he had to make a living and so i think a lot of people were understanding that some of the wrestlers weren't so happy about it but that's kind of what i heard more people were irritated with that i don't think he lived the best life he might have been kind of in poverty and i don't know if he got into drugs or anything like that but he also was plagued with some really bad health issues uh, towards the end of his life i think i think he had cancer and i think he might even had parkinson's or, de or early stage dementia i, I don't know 
Um, but yeah, just another guy lived really tough was, a, you know, imagine being in the WCW at the time when NWO was coming out. He was one of the first guys in the NWO because he came in with, with trillionaire Ted, right? Yeah. You know, Hollywood Hogan brings trillionaire Ted in and then he's with him, of course. And to, to basically then just got put in the background right away, because as, as we both know, NWO started to have about 150 different characters in there. That's and once do. again, he was, he was put in the background and what was weird to me about him is he he actually could wrestle he wrestled matches but for some reason he just a either wasn't as good at it or they didn't think they wanted to train him but after he became that kind of bodyguard to to ted that was it his wrestling career was pretty much already done yeah and, and maybe that's the role that he preferred you know some people have a comfort zone and once they find their lane they stick with it um or maybe at the time they didn't want to give him that that particular uh, push, you know. At the end of the day, he found his niche. He was good at it. He did it for a number of years. Um, I would hate to think that um, that he fell upon hard times, but we know that a lot of these wrestlers do. We know that they have health issues and they tend to die young. But uh, I choose to remember him for the work that he did do, um, the persona that he did have, and, uh, you know, God... God rest him and God bless his family. Completely agreed. And I think, uh, you know, perfect uh, cutway to the show here. He, you know, he had hard times, just like kind of all of us. We've all been through hard times and we're going to continue on. And we're going to keep bringing you these podcast shows and coming at you, you know, every week with with our brand of topics and humor. So please like and subscribe. And uh, as always, JD out, Mo Money. Yes, indeed. Last comments. Yeah. Listen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to keep coming, hitting you upside the head every chance we get. We're hoping you're enjoying the work that we're doing. Hope to see you soon. Indeed. Take care. Good night.